The more I try and speed up, the more everything goes sideways. She's crying, now I'm upset, now I'm, and it ends up taking us longer. If you're finding something that you used to always enjoy and now you don't find any enjoyment from it, that's a sign of burnout. The season that I'm in is to just move slowly and intentionally. They're yeah. shoving stuff in their closet before you come visit to make it look less messy. The more grounded you are, those fears, they're gonna be there, but you're gonna be able to handle them a little bit different or approach it differently. Is the reward greater than the risk? Whole is an acronym that stands for feeling worthy, happy, optimistic, loved, and empowered. If you want something, we can make a version of it happen. There's lots of different ways to become a single mom by choice. I had at most an 11% chance of it working in one round wow. of IVF. You gotta mm -hmm. slow down and enjoy life. Mom! My favorite thing about meeting new people is how multifaceted they are and how they all have different layers to their stories that we don't know anything about. And our guest today is a perfect example of that. Drawing on over 13 years of experience of being a coach and a therapist and fueled by her own remarkable journey of turning the impossible into reality, Abby founded Evolving Whole. She works with the ambitious parents and professionals to conquer burnout, to achieve the life of their dreams, and have fulfillment in all areas of their life. Abby is also a guiding light for women on unique journeys, whether it's IVF, the path to becoming a single mom by choice, or navigating the whirlwind of postpartum life. Together, they craft strategies to embrace life's challenges and uncover the evolving identity that accompanies motherhood. On a personal note, against many odds, she became a single mom by choice at the age of 41 to her now 22-month-old daughter, and Abby is the founder of the Ambitious Mamas Collective, which is a space to thrive and offers free virtual meetups, self-driven bombs, connect, share struggles, wins, resources, and time for reflection. This conversation is so good. We talk about what is the difference between being burnt out and tired? How do we honor the things we want, like a clean house without being crazy and running all over the place and being able to slow down and be present? We talk through Abby's journey to being a single mom by choice. And we also leave you with a little bit of a cliffhanger in what we're going to talk about next time we have her back. So grab some headphones, grab a beverage, dive in. This is such a good conversation. Abby, I'm so excited to have you here. I always love the before we click record conversations and we're just chatting about however you feed your baby, how much time it takes to feed your baby. And Abby's daughter's 22 months. My third is three months. And we're just talking about how we would get so much time back, but yet it's such a great way to connect with your child. So often we have these experiences that we don't really realize are benefits because we can so easily just be like, oh, this is taking time for me. I just want to jump in right there. What are some of the ways in the women that you work with and that you see through your therapist work, your coaching and your community, we're deciding that something is not a benefit? And how do we flip that script and look at it def differently? So the example we were just talking about was nursing. And it could be feeding your baby even with a formula bottle, but your hands are tied up doing something and you can think about all the other things you should be doing when really this is a really great time to be present and connect. What are some other ways that comes up for you where you're like, oh, wait, slow down. This is actually what you wanted. I think it just goes to show maybe like the patterns that you have in your life that you weren't aware of quite yet of always trying to do more. And so I think sometimes like when my daughter, like get your shoes, get your shoes. Like she knows at this point, like where her shoes are and she can put a certain pair on and she's just not doing it. And I'm like, she's telling me to slow down. And the more I try and speed up, the more everything goes sideways. Now, like yeah. the water has spilled, like this happened. She's crying. Now I'm upset. Now I'm, and it ends up taking us longer. So I think with any activity, the more that we try and go faster, the longer it actually takes us. And so I think if you can think in that mindset, when you slow down, you can be more focused and more productive and find the solution. And then it won't take you as long. Oh my gosh. I think that's such a good it all makes sense, right? There's all these things where it's like, well, duh, that would make sense. But we do have so many places we have to be. I'm trying to teach my kids about time right now because I feel like when we are running late for something, they're just like, why do you care what time we get there? And I'm like, because there's a certain time we have to get there. <laughs> so we've been talking about this a lot and trying to teach them the numbers and things. 
And something that we've implemented is it is so important to me that we don't have a chaotic morning, that we're not rushing to get to school on time. But the reality is we have to get to school at a certain time. And if people aren't moving quick enough, I have to help encourage them to move a little quicker. And so it but to your point, when we do that often, it creates this emotional, why are you rushing me? And we're getting out at the door. One thing that has worked so well for us over the last couple of weeks is we have a specific song that we've been playing when we get in the car. We've been turning the car into a rocket ship and we've been going to planet school. This concept has made them so excited to get into the car. They're like, let's go. Let's helmets on everybody. And they just keep adding parts of it without me even initiating. They'll be like, okay, mom, your button into your helmet's over here. And but slowing down to even have that idea of, okay, let's make the car a rocket ship. I had to slow down to be like, okay, what can I do to make this fun? And what can I do to be more present in this, even though we still have to get in the car at a certain time? That's easier said than done to be like, okay, we need to be more present. But one of the things that you talk a lot about is being burnout. And I know that if I'm not burnt out and I'm not tired, I can be more creative and not even creative in my business, but in motherhood. And that allows me to be more fun and not be so distracted. So let's start with some of the red flags, because I told you before we clicked record today, I'm a little tired today. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, one, what is the difference between being burnt out and being tired? Like, how do you know if you're just tired? How do you know if you're burnt out? I think it can be both. And so burned out is if you're feeling tired all the time. And then, of course, people are like, is that depression? And it can be, but sometimes burnout leads to depression or maybe depression leads you to feeling burned out. They can go hand in hand and they can be separate. But if you're feeling tired on more days and not able to recharge that battery at all, that's probably closer to burnout. And burnout, there can also be a lot of other physical manifestations. You might be feeling like quick to anger You might have like more physical pains than you're used to. Brain fog is another great example. And it's just every day you're feeling that way. That overwhelm where you're like, oh, I used to handle that situation and now I can't. Or if it's something you used to really enjoy. For example, I'm a paddleboarder. I love it. And there was one time it was very close to me being like, I'm so burned out, but I'm so afraid I wasn't going to enjoy the thing that I loved the most. Because as much as that would recharge my battery, That was also draining me at one point because I had turned it into a competitive sport. If you're finding something that you used to always enjoy and now you don't find any enjoyment from it, that's a sign of burnout too. Ooh, okay. And let's get super tactical in the day-to-day. We're just talking about getting out of the door and getting ready. Let's say you're irritable, you're pushing your kids to get out of the door, you're stressed out. Are those signs of normal motherhood? Is that sign of burnout? Is that, and I know it's going to be different for each person, but like using that situation as an example, if you're like, I cannot get myself for this to be a good experience, what are some of the things that you would recommend to try to even just get like the train back on the tracks? Mm -hmm. I think giving ourselves permission to slow down is the biggest one. Okay, so that day you're really rushing. The rocket ship is not being boarded fast enough. (laughs) Okay. I'm just going to be late to school today. It's not convenient. Sure. They're going to check off the box that your kids were late, but just say, I'm going to take a few deep breaths before this rocket ship leaves the driveway and recenter myself for a few moments. Encourage the kids to do it. If you can teach them this coping skill, it's great. We're going to take a couple of deep breaths before the rocket ship takes off. And then go on to the next task. And I think so often we're just like, we got to get to the next thing that we don't take a moment to just take a pause. And that can, again, recharge us in those quick little moments to then have that creativity, to have that clear mind to say, oh, it's okay. Like, we're going to be five minutes late. Like, it'll be okay. Yeah. Something that I hear a lot from our community is just they're in this burnout overwhelm of just doing all the things. And they're not always in this place of complaining about it. They're just more of the factual. I have so many things like I am not able to slow down. And I'm really excited to get your perspective on this because one, you have the professional background of how to support this. But two, personally, you're a single mom by choice and you're doing it all by yourself. There isn't 
any support system and never has been. And that is a little more unique where sometimes during those earlier stages, whether you're a single mom now or not, there was maybe someone there at some point, although we've had other moms on this podcast before and they're like, it made it more challenging. It was easier when it was just me. So talk to me a little bit about how do you support yourself when there isn't someone there to be like, hey, can you pick up the pieces here? What are some of the ways that you're navigating that? Yeah. So one, my mom watches my daughter when I'm working. So I do have that support. And then like she'll help out if I want to like cook dinner or something like that sometimes. But for me, the biggest thing is finding ways to self-care and relax with my daughter. And she's also one of the like Velcro babies too. So there's times where it was very challenging And again, it was a reminder to slow down, put on that song that felt good and dance for a little bit. It's going to calm my nervous system down and get her calm and feel attached and feel part of it. Going for walks was really important as another thing for me to get some physical movement. It wasn't about how fast I was going. It was just like, can I be outside for as long as I can get movement, talk to my daughter as we're doing this. She wasn't always a stroller baby either. So like what's going to feel good for me and how can I incorporate her is one great thing. And then I love creating like a to-da list. Your to-do list is always going to be there. I don't think I've met anyone that has a clear to-do list because as soon as you're checking a few things off, you're adding another few things. So I like to think throughout the day, what did I get done today? And sometimes what I got done today was like, I did go for that walk. I sat down and I took a breath. I finished my cup of coffee. Like, how did I finish my cup of coffee? My daughter's really into Play-Doh right now. I give her the Play-Doh. I, she plays. I mold Play-Doh, which is relaxing to me. And I sip my coffee. How can I do these things to set myself up for a better day? And then again, what things have I accomplished that day that make me feel good? Yeah. And I think a huge takeaway that we can all remember is it doesn't have to be a big event. I think so often we get caught up in how am I going to fit that into my schedule when it only needs to be a couple minutes. Even if you're sitting down and you're just playing with Play-Doh for five minutes or you're listening to one song, like you said, and dancing, okay, three minutes and 50 seconds at the long end, you're dancing and really listening to some music. I think that is such an important thing for us all to remember. And again, coming back to this theme of slowing down, When you are just rushing, you don't think you even have three minutes, but the reality is we all have three minutes somewhere in our day where we could do some of these things. And I think that is just truly like the biggest thing to remember is you have to slow down enough to be present enough to even take those three minutes here and there. And how can you kind of have it stack with time with whoever? So you're saying like, playing Play-Doh and drinking your coffee, like giving yourself something and then also being present for her. I know with our moms of older kids, they say like one of the best ways to connect with their teens is to splurge on that Starbucks beverage and take them in the car to Starbucks, in the drive-thru, sit in the line, have conversations and get them that drink because it's one of the ways that they can connect. And that might take you a total of 15 minutes or so to drive to Starbucks, go through the drive-thru, but you probably have that 15 minutes. And you probably have that, it's at this rate, probably $15 too, but (laughs) being able to set that aside. And I think that's just such an important takeaway. What are some other ways, either you, your clients, your community members that you feel like in the day to day, I think one of the biggest things that people fall up against is also like household chores. Is there ways to not get burnt out with household chores when you, you have to do it, right? Or you end up in a big giant mess. So what are some ways that you can incorporate slowing down or being more present while also getting those things from your to-do list to your to-do list, if you said? I think, one, when we slow down, we can better communicate with our support people, too, Mm -hmm. where where we can be very clear. Hey, I need the laundry done. And you're thinking, like, I want it done, like, right now, and I want that laundry done this way. And the other person, even if you've been with them for the longest time, can't read your mind and they're going to do it your way or their way and they might pick up the wrong load or or whatever when we slow down we can get really clear as to what we need done the other thing is how can you have it stack too can you 
Like I threw in laundry while like breakfast was cooking real quick. How can I do that and get things done? And what time of day feels better for me to do laundry? Like that laundry I almost put in last night and I was like, oh no, I know when that dryer goes off, I'm not folding it. It's going to sit in the dryer for a really long time. I'm going to take it out and I'm going to throw it onto the couch and it's just going to sit there, become a mess. My dog is going to dig through it. What times of day do you feel better doing certain things? And if you're someone who's working like a nine to five job, you might say, I don't have that time. You can figure out like what time on the weekends. Like there is flexibility in there. Sometimes we don't think outside of the box for that. Also, you're in this season of life and it's not going to be always. Like you're not always going to have a newborn. So can you hire extra help and outsource it right now? Can you, maybe you just don't do the laundry quite as often as you used to. Maybe you do less deep cleans right now, but you're still cleaning as you go along. I'm trying to incorporate my daughter, at least have her seeing me do these chores. She's still contact nap. So I don't get things done when she's napping, which is also a benefit because it gives me time to slow down and I read my book and Sometimes I'm like, oh, I just wish you would nap on your own because I could work out and I could do all these things. But I think the season that I'm in is to just move slowly and intentionally. And I think when we slow down, we can move intentionally as to what chores and things we need to get done around the house. When it comes to like cooking dinner, how can you make it simple? What foods can you make that are simple? Maybe it's not how you used to cook. Again, you'll get back to that point. I love to cook. I used to make like elaborate meals. Now I'm like, what is easy? What is quick? Okay, we had the exact same thing like every Monday. That's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We're, we're fed. It's okay. So I think taking that expectation and the pressures off of ourselves to be perfect and have everything done. And I think having the conversations with other moms, I think sometimes we feel like shame or guilt or we're not doing enough. And there are a lot of other moms that are feeling the same way that aren't doing all the things. And I think sometimes it's not talked about that people have like extra help in doing those. And so we yeah. look at them, we're like, oh my gosh, their house is spotless and they have all these meals. And they're like, oh, we, we have someone that cleans our home and we have someone that delivers our groceries. And that's great. So I think understanding like where you are and know that there's other moms out there that are struggling just the same. And they're yeah. shoving stuff in their closet before you come <laughs> visit to make it look less messy. <laughs> yeah. I think that's so important. And something I, that last statement of you saying, like you go over to someone's house and they're shoving something in their closet before you get there. If I ever feel like I'm judging myself against someone else, I try to always question myself and just be like, okay, why do you care? Like, why do you care that person's house is clean? Why do you care that person has their meals done or that you're not doing this or that person's doing this? And I'll give you an example, and I'd love your perspective on this, where recently I saw someone post a video of their son riding a bike, and he was like crushing it, doing such a good job riding his bike. And we have not done a great job at encouraging our kids to learn how to ride a bike to that level yet. And my kids have so many other things that they're amazing at, but that's not been one that we've done because we don't really have a safe place right by our house for them to do it. And I caught myself in this moment where I was like, why do you care that kid who's similar age to yours is riding a bike better? And really trying to break down judging myself for not giving him the opportunity to do that. Was I just finding a reason to be like, look at what they've done and I haven't done. And what I realized once I sat with it for a little bit is I was like, I am judging myself, but it's because I think that my son would have fun with this. And I feel like I haven't given him that opportunity of fun yet. And so what I did in that moment for myself was like, okay, here are all the other ways we've been spending our time rather than Mm -hmm. doing that. So he's still having plenty of fun. But yes, I do want him to learn this skill because this is a skill that's going to show up in various parts of his childhood. So I do want to prioritize that. So rather than sitting in like why I hadn't done it, I tried to make the quick switch. It could have probably happened faster to say, okay, now how am I going to prioritize that? So what are some maybe coping mechanisms of when you realize you've dropped the ball somewhere or you haven't done something the way you want to be able to switch and get out of that mom shame and mom guilt mode, but get into, okay, either do something about it or it's not important and you don't need to feel that way. How do you make that shift in a professional way? Well, I think just reminding yourself that it is going to happen in whatever time and you're not like 
Your kid doesn't learn to ride their bike until they're older. There's no harm in that. It's okay. We're going to turn out okay. And I think you read lots of things of moms. So I'm an 80s baby. It was just it was just different. I think we just want, we have such high expectations. And because we see on social media, like if you hadn't seen that on social media, you might have no awareness that other kids are riding their bike at that level. There's like little babies, like snowboarding down a mountain that are, can't even walk, but they're snowboarding, right? Like you would have no idea that's even existing. So I think like coming back to where you are and what you want for your family and what you need to happen and focusing on that. Are you providing like a safe environment for your kid? Is your kid having fun? Is your kid feeling connected to you? That's the biggest piece too, is like that connection with their parents and their caregivers. And coming back to slowing down, I would assume, scientifically speaking, that your kids aren't going to feel as connected to you if you're not slowing down, if you're just rushing and you're all over the place. Mm -hmm. And what is like the day-to-day -day life look like for you? Because you're saying right now your daughter contact naps. She's a little bit of a Velcro baby. You're running your own business. You will have some support from friends and family. But at the end of the day, you're still a single mom. So how are you prioritizing yourself on a day-to-day -day while just navigating all the things? Are you more of a routine and structure person? Or is it like we have to get a couple of things done, but we're flowing throughout the day? What does it look like? So it's funny. I am by nature a super scheduled person. And then at one point in my life, I had to practice being spontaneous and have fun. That was probably like in my late 20s. I have a structure where in the afternoons, I work for a few hours. During the day, I do, in the fall and winter, I have structured activities for us. We do like a music class and we do a caregiver and me nature school. We did swim for a little bit. I stopped doing swim because it was feeling too rushed to go to swim and then come home. And that was like my longer work day and rushing right into it. I was like, this doesn't feel good for me. I'm rushing her. I show up for my first session, just feeling not great. So I was like, we don't need to do swim right now. It's okay. This summer, I decided not to sign up for any activities. I just wanted to flow. So I know that there is like story time and different things. I do like to get up and get out of the house or do something first thing in the morning after breakfast, if possible, because sometimes the toddler, it doesn't work. So I live at the beach, so we go to the beach often, or I have some activities that I just know I want to do with her in the house. And I do those first after we eat, because if I can tire her out and keep her kind of busy and engaged She'll have a good nap, which sets me up for a better rest of the day. Like I said, I keep meals as simple as possible and I try and clean up with her around. And sometimes it's really not perfect. There's probably a thousand toys in my living room all over the place. All the kitchen foods are probably thrown all over because she's playing with it before I started to work today. And that's okay. That's okay. I'm stepping around and over toys and that's okay because this is like right now. And then I really focus hard on the transition into work. And that has been the, my biggest challenge. As a therapist, you code switch between clients and I've developed that muscle. But to go from mom brain into like work mode and especially work mode when I'm working on like content creation and writing blog posts, it takes me longer to do that. And so I listen to some music that really centers me. I might dance around in my office for a little bit without her. Sometimes I lay on the floor and I just stare at the ceiling and I'm like, deep breaths. Like I just need to come back into myself and then switch into that mode of work. And I do the same thing when work is done. It's very easy for me to just shut the laptop and then run out to her. But I try and shut the laptop and take a couple deep breaths for myself. I love music. So maybe listen to another song while I straighten up my office. And then go back into mom mode. Most of my self-care time is with her and we co-sleep at night. That was like a happy accident. And so like when she falls asleep, I read a book and I catch up on some text messages. And that's been nice, except it's summer and she's decided she wants to party it up and stay up later. I'm like, come on, I want to read my book and I'm tired. And I prioritize sleep. I'm like, I'm just going to go to bed early. And that's okay. 
And sometimes I'm like into a book and I'm like, nope, stop reading the book and just get your sleep because you need that for the next day. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, it's just so important to get in tune with what do you need and when do you need it and trying to make it work. Because what I hear from you is it's, you know what, in this season, we're really routine. In this season, we're flowing a little bit more. We're taking the things that are like hidden blessings, whether it's contact naps and co-sleeping or fruit on the floor, and we're making it a good thing right now. And I often see these videos where it'll say something along the lines of one day there won't be fingerprints on the window or one Mm -hmm. day you won't be tripping over that toy. And it's really interesting if I love us mom communities, but we are not always connected. There's a lot of division in these mom communities and mom comment sections online. And I think that's great. We could all be a little nicer. If you're listening, you're allowed to have your opinions, be a little nicer, maybe. But we go into, I see these people, it's don't make moms feel bad for wanting a clean house. That should give them peace and joy. And then other moms are like, yeah, but you really aren't going to get this back. Enjoy the toys, like play and be present. And I'm a big, the truth is probably in the middle somewhere type of person. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good example of that. I do perform better when my house is clean. I like my house being clean. I also find plastic bugs all over my house all the time that are scaring the heck out of me. And I have fingerprints everywhere and toys that are all over the place. And I'm trying to find what that balance is. And I don't think that there is one right balance. I think it's figuring out what it is for you and your household. What would you tell the mom that wants a cleaner house and can't figure out how to make it work with her current life? just going back to that conversation even before of judging ourselves is do you want to clean your house because it makes you feel better or do you want to clean your house because you think you're supposed to have a cleaner house and Mm -hmm. you're judging yourself for that but let's talk about first the person that's no I really this makes me feel better this is how Mm -hmm. I'm taking care of myself what would you tell a client that's coaching them through okay I know that you want this thing also how do you get present and enjoy the mess in the meantime what are some ways that people can slow down? I think it comes back to slowing yeah. down like we've been talking about, yeah. but what, tactically. Does the house have to be clean all day too? Mm. Are there times where you're like, okay, kids, between nine and 10, messy. And we know Go and we're going to have sections of time where we're going to like straighten up and try and again, like your rocket ship, like how can you make it fun and get them involved in it? Especially at a young age, there's lots of research when you do that. Then they continue as they get older and even give it to older kids. Like how can they make it fun? And so if you have older kids, ask them, what are their solutions? Kids are brilliant and they come up with like such great ideas that we don't even think about. So ask them. So if it's, I want my house to be clean before I go to bed at night. So I wake up to a clean house. Like how can you structure your day to have that time? I know a lot of people are struggling financially But if it means cutting back in another area of your life to have someone come in and help clean, deep clean your house once a week or whatever, if that's going to be better for your mental health and it might mean you're cutting back on your Starbucks, like do that for yourself. And I think sometimes we're like, yeah, but I can clean. But what would the cost to you be if you're the one that's cleaning versus having someone else do it? Yeah, we know you're physically capable, but. Like, why not have someone else do that for you? It gives another job to someone else who might need it. And it gives you time to then take your kids to the playground while your house is being clean. And then you have that connection with your kids and you come home to that. Yeah. Or how can you break it up? The other thing is, where is that coming from that you want a spotless home? And I had a client years ago who grew up, when I started working with her, she was in her 60s. We were working on various things, but she came from a very unstable home life, but watched the Brady Bunch growing up. And she had started like reflecting on how she was raising her kids and having to have her house spotless and had used substances to try and keep herself focused and energized in order to have everything organized and spotless. And I said, wait a minute, you grew up watching the Brady Bunch? yeah, that's what our house should look like. I said, didn't they have a nanny that lived in? And I didn't grow up watching. And she was like, oh my gosh. And so she wanted her house to be so structured that when she'd go back and watch videos at Christmas time, it's her picking up all the wrapping paper and putting it away and not engaging with her kids at all. And because her story was, 
a clean, organized house felt safe. And it came from watching the Brady Bunch based on like her childhood growing up and not feeling safe. And I said, here you were a working mom of two kids trying to keep the house spotless of two very rambunctious boys too. That's not reality because they had a nanny. They had someone doing it. So sometimes I think it's like, where is that story coming from? Do we need to change that story or that voice we hear? And maybe not. And so then how can you adapt to make that work for you? That's such a good insight. And I'm like sitting here thinking about what things have I pulled from the Brady Bunch or whatever shows <laughs> that you're I pulling think- back? Because it, it is, you don't realize that. The things that maybe you watched or even homes or people you were around when you were a kid that you've completely consciously forgot about, but subconsciously you're carrying with you. And I'm sure maybe this is more regular for you to think about with your background and your experience. But for us non-therapist people, we are like, oh, that makes sense. I would have never thought about it that way. This brings me to another point. I feel like anxiety is like a top conversation right now. Buzzword, especially in kids. And I went through my season of childhood where I was a very anxious teenager as well. And I've learned some coping mechanisms for myself, but I'm trying to be really aware about how I project this onto my kids. If we have some of these tendencies, we can't fix them all overnight, right? It's just becoming Mm -hmm. aware. Let's say we are running around trying to keep our house spotless because we're realizing from the Brady Bunch or we're rushing out the door, whatever it is, we can't wake up tomorrow and be completely different. So as we're going through a process of trying to work on these things, how can we at least stop it with us? What are some ways for us to be aware when we're maybe projecting this into our household and our family, not even just our kids? And how can we create like a better environment and culture, even if we're still internally dealing with something? Are there any ways to put up a wall where it's, okay, that's something I'm working on, but I'm not going to let it out this way. And so I'm thinking like when it comes to anxiety that we would create around our kids, with having a clean house. So if we want our house to be clean, we're not being like, oh, don't leave that there. Don't pick it up. And then the kids are just like freaking out because they always have to clean up after themselves or Mm -hmm. they're running late. Or I'm also thinking of like fear, just fear in general of moms are scared often of their little ones getting hurt. How Mm -hmm. do we allow our kids to go do things without projecting that fear onto them so I think those are a couple different examples take with it any way that Mm -hmm. you want how do we life and not let our things go to our kids if I had that answer man I would be like a millionaire magician so I think okay again I'm gonna come back to slowing down because when you have more of an awareness of this is my stuff and my fear you can slow down Mm -hmm. with your response to it and the other pieces be honest hey, mommy has a fear of the ocean and this is why mom has taken swim lessons or mom wears a life vest when she's not even on the boat or something like that. Like, it doesn't mean that they have to, all kids have to wear a life vest and stuff on boats, but owning it a little bit or what is your coping? Maybe they saw you like freaking out that the house was messy and you were yelling and you were feeling angry, like put words to it. Mom was feeling frustrated and angry because Mm -hmm. the house was messy. And you can add in, what did you do to bring yourself back? And that teaches them lots of coping mechanisms. You hear a lot of kids or like grownups don't have some relationship skills because they didn't see their parents fight. So they never witnessed that. And not that we want to be fighting all the time in front of kids. But if we do, they also don't see the repair process, which is really important, that conversation that then happens. Again, kids don't have to see and hear everything, but I think giving some examples of, hey, this happened and this is how I handled it. And it doesn't have to Mm -hmm. be in that moment because sometimes in that moment we can't see it. But if it's later and you bring it back up, like, hey, yes, I screamed at all of you in the car because I needed quiet. I'm sorry that happened. Here's how I handled it. And here's what I would have maybe have done different. Mm-hmm. Mommy was frustrated with other things. I think oftentimes other environmental things that are crushing us. And then we yeah. just get frustrated or it comes out in other ways or that fear comes out. The more grounded you are, those fears 
they're going to be there, but you're going to be able to handle them a little bit different or approach it differently. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. I'm thinking I just read this article the other day of someone that went to a foam bounce house place and there was like a metal rod sticking through the foam bounce house. And so they like cut their knee open and they're suing the place. Again, the comment section of the online world, you find out things that you never knew. All of these people are talking about like people that have been paralyzed, passed away, serious injuries from these places. And I literally screenshotted it and sent it to my husband and said, how am I ever going to let my kids go to a birthday party at one of these things? And I still don't know the answer to that. But when you were talking, what it made me think is, okay, one solution could be if I wanted to let them go, it could be having a conversation of, okay, I'm a little nervous about you going here because of this. So when you get there, maybe you can try to walk through it first before you jump in and see if there's a space or have a conversation about it. I still don't know what I'm going to actually do, but it brought me back to that when you were like, okay, you can communicate, you can talk about like why you're feeling this way, why you maybe instead of just being like, nope, they're not going to one of those ever because that scares me. Is there any using again that as an example, is there anything else that you can think of when that situation comes up for me that I could be like, okay, here's how I could protect my fear, keep them safe ish. We can't, we don't know. That's the thing. We don't Mm -hmm. know if we can keep them safe, but think we're making a good choice and still let our kids kid. Yeah. I think where's the compromise? Is there a compromise in a way? Like, okay, we're going to buy smaller bounce house. Or I remember there was one of the bounce house flew away with a kid on it. This happened years ago from the wind. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Ours was like a trampoline. I was not as a kid. My mom was like, you don't go on trampolines. Anyone that goes on a trampoline breaks their neck. And it just came up the other day because I said, oh, I think Poppy needs like a trampoline, one of those small in-house ones. She's like, no yeah. trampolines. Blah, blah. And I'm like, I've been on one as an adult and they scare me yeah. still because I'm like, it just doesn't feel like in control. Will I let her go on a trampoline? I think there's going to be limits at first and see how she handles yeah. herself. Like those big yeah. tramp indoor trampoline parks. I'm like, not yet. I think it would be like when it's not as crowded. I think there's certain things yeah. like certain safety is like what part, what pieces can I control a little bit, but still allow her to have that experience? Yeah. And then sometimes you just might be right. You just might be like, you know what? We're not doing this bounce house. You show up and you're like, oh, this doesn't look like, you know. I had friends that like we went and the adults all ended up in the bounce house. We soaked it. It was just chaotic. Like I'm shocked someone did not get hurt. And so go in the bounce house, but maybe not when it's foamed up because that just seems dangerous. Yeah. What's your comfortability and then work up on that. Yeah. Is it? It's so hard, right? We got to keep our kids safe and do all these things. And I think I see these videos of people at these bounce houses and all these things. And I we don't have one near where we live. So if you're listening and you're like, it's like the thing to do in your town, you're probably like, we go mm-hmm. all the time. But since we don't have one right where I live, it hasn't come up yet. And I'm just like, I see these videos and I'm like, that looks so fun. But I don't feel like the reward is higher than the risk for me at this mm-hmm. point in time. And I feel like that's how I'm making decisions in my life right now is the reward greater than the risk. And I think we think about that in terms of like finances and investments. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, sure, there's that too. But it's also is the reward of going to meet up with my friend for coffee greater than the risk of, okay, we're going to have our kid out of the house or I have to get a sitter or whatever it is. And is so that's how my brain is processing things right now. Are there any other like tools or systems that you would recommend when it comes to like decision making and evaluation of weighing to or to not make a decision for you? So what place are you in when you're working through that decision? I like to talk about being half and whole. And when you're whole, you're grounded in being rational. It's easier to make decisions. So whole is an acronym that stands for feeling worthy, happy, optimistic, loved, and empowered. And then when you're half, you're more irrational. You might be like quick to make a decision. You might struggle to make that decision. And that's when you're feeling hurt, angry, anxious, lonely, fearful, frustrated. And so if you're feeling half, might be a time to dial back, not make that decision right now. It's okay to not make a decision right away and put it off? Or how can you ground yourself in a whole feeling to make that decision and say, okay, I'm coming from a place 
like the bounce house trampoline. I'm coming from a place of fear. Maybe like I fell off a trampoline when I was a kid. So I'm fearful of it right now. I just read an article about it. I'm feeling fearful. How can I ground myself into feeling whole in general to then make another decision about it? Or this is not the season to make decisions on trampolines and bounce houses. We'll tackle that when that comes up. Or maybe I need a better introduction of it. I know so many people that go to the trampoline parks and it looks fun. It also, to me, looks really scary. Like, I don't know if I know how to bounce on one of those. Maybe I need to like go or go with my kid in order to experience it. And then the same thing when you're making decisions about spending time with friends or let's say there's a barbecue or some type of event. Am I coming from a place of feeling half or whole when I'm making this decision. If I'm already feeling frustrated and overwhelmed, maybe right now the answer is no, instead of rushing and going, or will going and having coffee with that friend help me feel whole to then have make better decisions. I love that. that is like such a great way to end that because I truly feel that way certain times when I make coffee dates with friends and I want to have everyone listening prioritize whatever that version of something is for you. Mm-hmm. Because I so often will be like, oh, I don't have the time or the money or the whatever to go do that thing. And to your point, when you come out of that, you can become more whole if you weren't before, literally and as the acronyms. I absolutely love that. Okay, Abby, there are so many people in the world that don't step into motherhood because they haven't found the right partner. They haven't Mm -hmm. found the way that they thought they were going to step into Mm -hmm. motherhood. And I want to make sure that we give that part of your story enough justice and time to talk about. I want to first come back to what did it look like before you even made that decision? Were you like, okay, this just hasn't happened the way that I thought it was going to? Or were you like, this was always the plan? I just want to be a single mom. What was the first approach? And then let's talk about the logistics for someone that either wants to do this or know someone that they could support? How do you actually take action on this? And why I'm so passionate about this, this conversation is because I have lots of people in my life that are like, I want to be a mom so bad, but I just haven't found the person. And I strongly believe like you can do anything you want to do in life. It might just look different than you thought. You might have to put work Mm -hmm. in differently. But if you want something, we can make a version of it happen. And I think you're such an inspiration for just living that out and showing it. So take us back, walk us through this journey. Yeah, it's funny as I reflect. One point in my life, I thought I would be a single mom because my mom got divorced and she ended up being a single mom. And even when my parents were married, my mom was like a single mom in a marriage. Mm -hmm. She did everything. And I was like, well, that just looks easier. Plus I didn't want to share holidays. Like I would, I had friends that had to go wherever and like people fight about holidays. And I was like, I love my Christmas the way my Christmas is. And I never want to share it with anyone else. So it's really funny. But then yes, I had lots of relationships where I felt like it was going to go somewhere and it didn't. And then as I was approaching like my late thirties, I would find people that just didn't want to have kids. And I was like, I don't know if I can go through life and not become a mom. I want to experience that. I've always wanted to be a mom. And I did a lot of deep work on it and went to therapy and was like, nope, like I need to be a mom. I want to know what it feels like. I want to experience it. So on my 40th birthday, there was like, oh, like an oh shit moment. Like I'm 40 is, can I even have kids at this point. Cause all of a sudden you like wake up and you're like, oh wait, I'm 40. Like how did this happen? And I know like I was dating and really my intentions of dating was like to find someone. And there was so much pressure. I was like, I need to find someone so we could get married and have kids. Cause that's how you're supposed to do it. And then I was like, wait, I don't have to. And at 40, I was like, this is like my gift to myself. It's like, I'm going to find out like what the process is. So funny enough, I had years prior had found some woman that I followed on Instagram who was going through becoming a single mom. I was like, how do you do this? And so she gave me the terms, which was single mom by choice. I had no idea. I was like, I don't know what to even look. And so the first step really is go to a fertility clinic. A lot of primary care doctors and OBGYNs won't know, might not know the steps. Do a consult, 
have that conversation on what that would look like. They can do some blood test results and see what your statistics might be. But again, like they can do a lot. Science is amazing. So they can do a lot of things. And even if you're someone who is younger listening to this podcast, look into egg freezing. That's an option too. I always thought egg freezing, I couldn't afford it. And now there are insurance plans that can help you do that. I think it's more readily accessible. But I just thought that's just out of, no one does that really. Like you just hear yeah. a few people. But I think ask your questions, go have a consult. They're usually free and get your your questions answered and then you can make your decision. There's lots of different ways to become a single mom by choice. You can do IUI or IVF. There's lots of options in between there and weigh your options what's going to be best decision for you. I went straight to IVF because I didn't want to waste any more time. I didn't want to take the money and the time to put into IUI. So I went right into IVF and the rest is kind of history. I don't know. What other questions do you have? Well, first, <laughs> let's break down I, yeah. IUI and IVF because I'm yeah. actually not as familiar with IUI. So we break down those two for us. So IUI, sometimes it's medicated, sometimes it's not. And they, how do I even explain it? You just get like a donor sperm and the turkey baster method, but you can do yeah. it at home insemination or you can do it in, at a clinic. So that's what IUI is. IVF is okay. the process of having, let me get my words right around here, is medicated. You are going to have your embryos removed or not embryos yet. They're your follicles and your uh, eggs removed, and then they're going to fertilize them. And then they are, sometimes you could do a fresh transfer of an embryo, which is like a few days after retrieval or you do a frozen transfer. And so you can transfer your embryos at any time. You could also do up until you can have your embryos frozen and you could decide years later to transfer. Wow. Yeah. That is, it's such an interesting process. How long did this take you from the moment you made this decision to the moment that you were carrying? Like not, not even nine months. I like went full steam ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. That's yeah. awesome. So I, so my birthday was in January. I made the decision. I hesitated a little bit in the summertime. I had a consult and then it was just getting finances together, picking a donor sperm and just then starting the retrieval process. And the medication takes like a certain amount of weeks. Uh, did the retrieval in the fall. So bad. I don't even remember all the dates because you're just like going through it. And then I transferred in December and on my 41st birthday, I got to hear my baby's heartbeat. So oh it was gosh. the best birthday present ever. Yeah. What a crazy so 12 months. I had at most an 11% chance of it working in one round wow. of IVF. And I was lucky. It's not always the case. Sometimes you have to do more rounds. Um, so it's an amazing, like I said, science is amazing. Yes, there's a lot of risk to it. There's a lot of cost to it, but I'm always happy to like answer questions and help like women through making that decision for themselves. There's also, there are a lot of great um, Facebook groups that if you're trying to check out and people tell their stories on there too, or can give advice, but definitely so work with a fertility clinic. I think they can give you the best suggestions for you. As to what course, whether it's IUI, IVF, the timing and all of it. So amazing. What would you say up to this point has been the biggest surprise or challenge through this experience? It might just feel like motherhood as a whole. It doesn't even have to be related to coming into motherhood that way. So work related, I thought, so I thought during the first few months of postpartum that I would I want to write a book. I want to do all of these other things. And I thought, when the baby's sleeping, I could be doing this. And I really had to shift those expectations and slow down. And I ended up taking more maternity leave than I expected to. I just knew to show up for clients, my brain just wasn't there. And my heart yeah. like was, I wanted to be with my daughter. So that delayed the process on a lot of things that I thought my high achieving self was like, I'm going to do it all. Right. And still that's something I have to keep in check because I only have so many hours a week that I work. And like, 
thinking of like I have other colleagues who were on career paths that are similar of some of the things that we want to do in our career and they're not in the same space as me as being a mom and I'm like wait but they're doing that and then I have to remember they have more time they have like more so I think the other thing is like not being in competition with others and not comparing yourself to others like your journey is your journey and you're going to get there like I wanted to be a mom I got there yeah it just didn't go the initial route like I really was like I always thought like high school, you go to college, master's degree, get married, have a kid, like that path. Yeah. It wasn't, but I still got there. Yeah. And who knows? Uh, maybe I find Prince Charming when I'm, who knows? I'm still in my 40s, my 50s. Who knows when that happens? But so you're going to happen on your path the way you're supposed to happen on your path. And the other thing is I knew I would love being a mom, but I did not know. But I would love it this much. Oh, and I know it sounds like really cheesy, but it's just. Like, but the moms get I'm it. Just, it the non-moms, just, they don't get it. But I just tear up about it. Like my heart is like so much bigger. I never thought you could love like this. Like you hear about it, but you don't know until you feel it. You know. And just in awe every day, like someone who I used to work with kids, my clients were kids at first and developmentally, but to see it every day, the changes her talking and how she's like trying to like come up with the words. And so while I'm working less and I've taken the risk to work less and make less money, I get to see these developments happen and it's really priceless to see. And it's amazing to see like how their brains work and how the personalities come about. And it's just such a beautiful experience that I'm so glad I did it nothing to take the place of this experience like you just there's no words there's no words no oh my gosh as much as I feel like we need to just end it there because it's like what do you say after that I do want everyone to know where they can find you (laughs) how can everyone connect with you you have a free monthly call for moms to connect so the third Thursday of the month I have the ambitious mamas collective which is a free virtual meetup You can find all that on my website at evolvingwhole.com. You can feel free to message me on there or Instagram is evolvingwhole. I share my stories, like some things about motherhood, some things about like mental health and whatever. If a mom has a question or if someone who's listening, that's not a mom has a question, like I'm always open to, to give answers or help find answers and resources. Amazing. And you support through both therapy and coaching for Mm -hmm. anyone looking to come through burnout and get support just really on life. Who would be like the right person to work with you if they're looking for support? Yeah. So I think it's as people who feel like they're over, they overcommit themselves often. They're high achievers. They're perfectionists. They're type A. I feel like I'm all of those, but never identified as that. But someone who's, I'm always striving to do better, but I also want to enjoy life Mm -hmm. and not let it pass me by and not understand what that means necessarily. Like you're the person, or if you're feeling stuck, you're like, I woke up and I don't know anymore about my life. And I don't have the answer of even where I want to go. That's a good fit too. Yeah. And if you're like, I don't know, I don't know if I want to be a mom or not. Let's talk about it because it's okay to not go that path or to go that path in in a completely different way than you ever expected. I love it so much. What is something that you're really excited about right now? A goal that's lighting you up when you think about what your current goal is in life? What is it personally and professionally? Something you're working towards. (laughs) I know. Oh my gosh. So Um, right now I'm actually working with some women on what their next three month goal is. So let's say that in the next three months, what is something that you're looking to accomplish? So I did this, this work in person workshop, which I haven't done in person workshops in a really long time. And it's on motherhood driven to, I called it driven to involve empowering motherhood. And I did this in person workshop a few weeks ago and it just lit me up in so many different ways. And so I will be doing them both virtually and in person, um, talking about uh, like being assertive without feeling bitchy. Again, like talking about half and whole and diving in deeper as to what like your half things are and what your whole things are and how to bridge that gap. 
um, talking about like communication, like how to communicate better with people around us and having ourselves feel heard and just the motherhood, like the motherhood journey in general. And I really want to have a space where in general, give themselves permission to enjoy like a slower life and how that leads to so much more success and fulfillment. So those workshops are really like the piece that I'm working on. So Awesome. Bringing it full circle with that slowing down theme. We got to mm-hmm. slow down and enjoy life. So Abby, thank you so much for your time today. This was such a great conversation. And we're definitely going to have you back because my next question for you, I'm going to put it up here for the next time that we record mm-hmm. together, is how you are going to navigate future conversations as a currently single mom or around the dad figure and mm-hmm. what you wish other kids would say and ask questions around. So we're going to leave that cliffhanger there. We're going to have you come back that. and we're going to talk about this in a little bit later. But thank you so much for being here. You, your story, and what you have to offer this world fills me up. I want to meet you. Join me on Instagram at this is Kelsey Smith, and let's create a ripple effect for mamas with.